Hello, everyone. This is Colleen Milton, and on behalf of SysDig and 451 Research, I would like to welcome you and say thanks for attending today's webcast titled Containers, Microservices, and Multiple Clouds. Oh, my. Scaling Cloud Native to Meet Ops and Security Demands. Leading off today's discussion will be Fernando Montenegro, who is Principal Analyst at 451 Research. Joining Fernando will be Knox Anderson, who is Director of Product Management at SysDig. Just a few quick housekeeping items before we get started. To ask a question, simply type it in the question box on your screen, and we'll get to as many as we can. The presentation slides are available for download in the resources section on your screen. And finally, please check back for the on-demand version of this webinar after the conclusion of the live event. And with that, I'll turn it over to Fernando. Hello, everyone. Uh, Fernando Montenegro here. Thank you so much for taking the time to, to join us in this conversation. Before we get started, I just wanted to give you a little bit of context on myself so we can understand uh, where, I'm, where I'm coming from. I'm an analyst here at 451 Research. Uh, the, the photo you see with the gray hair means I mean, I've been doing this for a, for a while now, for uh, many years in, uh, in technical roles and professional services and delivery, uh, mostly in the enterprise security space. Here at 451, I look after a, a few different areas of particularly, uh, particularly relevant to this discussion is I look after our cloud infrastructure security coverage. I also look at our container slash cloud native security conversation. And um, what's uh, one, one interesting thing is, I mean, I'm originally from Brazil, if it's there, I live now in Toronto, Canada. So uh, it's a glorious day here in Toronto. It's, uh, it's uh, everyone's in a good mood. If you want to uh, continue the conversation with me afterwards, I try to be active on Twitter. There's my handle there. By all means, let's have this conversation. One thing I wanted to, to, to comment on before we start is that I think that my perspective as an analyst, what I can bring to this conversation is uh, a, pers a view of what are we seeing out there when we talk to other organizations, when we, when we do our surveys. So I wanted to first frame where is that, uh, what's, what's illustrating our point of view. And there are two major pillars. On one hand, we are uh, an independent analyst firm. We have a, uh, uh, we'll, we conduct uh, research and so hundreds of hours talking to uh, people in enterprise IT, talking to service providers, talking to other security vendors. 451 Research as a firm, we have a, a a good pulse on uh, innovation and uh, and market investments, and so that's that's a lot of what we do. The other half of uh, of our uh, of our methodology is what we call our four five one voice of the enterprise uh, survey program. Some of you on this call may actually be respondents to this program, so if that's the case, thank you very very much for your participation. And this is a very rigorous uh, survey program that runs on a yearly basis, uh, surveying all of IT. And um, on, in each quarter, we'll ask different questions uh, on, on different topics. So, for example, we're just wrapping up, uh, uh, we just wrapped up the survey for Q2. So that's more along the lines of workloads and projects, for, uh, for example. Anyway, so what I wanted to, um, to talk on is what is it that we're seeing surveying IT when it comes to, uh, to, to cloud primarily, starting with. First of all, is that what we are seeing is that it's really difficult for organizations to say very clearly, hey, we are all in on cloud or we're not on cloud. And the, the, this survey here is uh, it's based on, we asked organizations where it is that they run the majority of their workloads now and where do they think they're going to be running those workloads two years in the future. So the way to interpret this chart is that in 2018, we had a, uh, uh, we asked organizations and they responded that 46% of their workloads were running on traditional on-premises infrastructure. And then they expected that by 2020, that number is going to drop to 21%. So the way to interpret this is not that 21% of the workloads are going to be traditional uh, infrastructure in 2020, but that 21% of respondents indicated that the majority of the workloads are going to be there. I guess that's what this, uh, what I wanted to bring about in, in this picture is that it's going to be, um, it's going to be varied in terms of where workloads are running. 
And also, there's a little bit of, a, of a, an optimism gap here in that if you look at how much uh, people expect things to drop from 2018 to 2020, uh, if you look at uh, how it dropped from 2018 to 2019, it didn't quite drop that much. The fact of the matter is that migrating to cloud is, um, uh, is not as, as, as clear-cut as most people think, which means that we're going to be having a, uh, a hybrid conversation for a long time. And that is precisely what we see here. We ask organizations, how are they moving to, a, how, how do they expect that they're going to be leveraging cloud and on-premises? And everyone basically says that, yes, it's going to be a hybrid IT environment uh, on-premises and, uh, and, and off. One interesting data point here is that uh, we asked the same question last year, and the difference from, la from last year to this year is that this number grew from 55 to 57. Uh, this number here uh, dropped down to 10% from, uh, from 13. So the fact of the matter is that more and more people are considering cloud a significant portion of their, uh, of their strategy. And uh, what are we seeing as far as to why they're, uh, for those that, that are modernizing their environment, I thought that this was a very interesting data point. By the way, all the data I've shown you so far is not asking security practitioners, it's asking IT in general. So what I thought was interesting here is that when we ask people, why are you modernizing your workloads for, for the on-premises workloads? We didn't, we didn't get to cloud yet. It's the, look at reason number two, uh, ensure data and system security. It means that uh, there is a need for updating. It's very clear to organizations that there is a need for updating security functionality uh, and security tooling and security processes, even on-premises workloads, on on-premises workloads as things get, uh, get uh, modernized. Moving on, just another point I wanted to, to, to make here is that when you talk about mission critical legacy applications, right, this is an interesting data point in that uh, there's a, there's a non-trivial number of people who say, who responded that for their mission critical legacy workloads, those workloads are going to stay on premises, but they're going to be modernized. So the answer being that uh, you are going to have more modern workloads on premises. You're going to have uh, cloud-based workloads and uh, and more. Now, this is uh, this is an interesting point. So, okay, if you are going to move to cloud, what's stopping you from moving to cloud for some of these workloads? And we're getting different answers here, but this one is is interesting. You ask organizations, why are they not having a broader implementation of, uh, of uh, infrastructure as a service in, in, in public clouds? And their major concern by far is security. This is data that we just released. Uh, and again, we're covering not just IT vendors, or sorry, not, not just IT, uh, not just security respondents, but IT management uh, across organizations. So this is, um, this is an indication that yes, security is very much an issue that's top of mind for uh, for organizations, and we're looking to uh, and we're looking to address that. Now, I wanted to switch the conversation a little bit and talk about what does the cloud presence, what does the modern presence on cloud looks like, and um, I put I put these numbers together based on, uh, on some responses across 2018 and 2019. But what you're seeing here is when we ask organizations what it is that you're doing on cloud, you look at the, and the responses come up with relational databases and analytics as, as, as being commonly deployed on IaaS. And then right after that, you have containers. So this, I, I, I think this is interesting because and if you go down the list, you'll see data warehouse, you'll see NoSQL, you'll see machine learning. There is, uh, as people move to cloud workloads, they are definitely adopting different architectures. It's not just we're going to pick up a VM, move that VM to cloud, and call it a day. Right? We are definitely seeing much more of an interest in uh, people modernizing what their presence looks like. And almost just, and, and so this was, we asked, where, what are you currently using? When we ask organizations what it is that you're going to be using, the, what I found interesting here is that there is a, um, 
there is a, a high percentage of respondents indicating that they're going to be doing machine learning. And then right after that, you have container workloads. One thing I wanted to comment on the machine learning, which I think is, is, is relevant, is that this is a, a testament to the fact that deploying machine learning pipelines on, uh, by, by hand is difficult and that the message from the large providers on, hey, you can use SageMaker, you can use AutoML, uh, those are resonating and people are looking towards those. But it, it's very interesting that people respond with containers as being the right next thing they're going to deploy. And um, when we dig into that, so why is it that, uh, that we expect people are deploying containers uh, so much? With, and by the way, if you look into uh, serverless compute or, or function as a service, it's, it's not far from there too. But if you look into why they're doing that, we ask them, okay, so the, the, this is kind of a proxy question, but we ask them, how are you designing cloud native applications? And the top answer was that they are designing it so that it can run anywhere. And if you're going to design it so you can, so it can run uh, anywhere, public or private, this is where the, 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 the container form factor and uh, the, the container ecosystem seems to have taken hold. Uh, whether that be, uh, personally, I would, I would, I would argue that, uh, that uh, we, we normalized on Kubernetes as the orchestrator that has had a significant uh, benefit in, in, in making this transition safer. Right? And then we have um, the portability of workloads as being something that's highly desired. So this is uh, so this points to migrate workloads are migrating and there's lots of containers workloads coming. Now I wanted to switch uh, switch tracks a little bit in that our uh, and, and discussing why it is that people are actually going to be deploying on cloud. And this is a, um, a survey. Now this was focused on security professionals only. Right? And we ask them, what can you use the cloud for? And you can see that there is a, a, a pretty consistent tendency of people responding that cloud workloads can be used for, uh, for mission critical data. Up until we had the, 20, uh, the 2018 data, which came in in, in, in December, right? uh, we had a, a very clear positive curve. We still have a very positive uh, uh, growth in terms of people responding that you can use even mission critical uh, workloads in public cloud. Now, this is this is very positive, and, and but I'm a I'm a data guy at heart. I like uh, I, I like looking at data in different ways. So we took the same uh, the same question and we broke it down by by other criteria. One of those criteria was how do people see themselves in terms of are they more of, a, of an early adopter uh, in their, their organizations are more uh, risk seeking or more, they, they want to be more of an early adopter. Are they more pragmatic? Are they more conservative? Are they skeptical? Or do they prefer they are very risk averse? And it should come as no surprise that uh, if the organization is more of an early adopter, they will also indicate that yes, you can use cloud for pretty much anything. The next one, uh, the, 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 the next one was interesting because I took the same data and we looked at, okay, how did uh, the, 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 the answers broke down based on what the respondent self-identified as. And then we, we just normalized some of the, the, the titles they used. But you can see here that people who self-identified as senior management have a very high response rate in terms of indicating that the cloud can be used for high security for mission critical workloads and i think that this is a this is a testament to two things first of all that we are seeing more much more uh, uh, risk taking or, or or more forward thinking leadership which is always great but we're also seeing a very uh, we're seeing the effect of the effort that the major cloud providers have done in demonstrating safety and, and, and security. I just came back from the, the Reinforce conference, for example, where we had 8,000 people looking at, at, at cloud security in AWS, just using as an example, right? And um, so I think that it's a testament that, that the message is getting through. What this means is that going 
from a security perspective, arguing that you're not going to be do something, doing something because the cloud is not secure, it's going to be more of an uphill battle uh, that people are going to have to fight. Now, what we see is that once the, uh, taking all this in, we see, if, we see an interest in uh, people upgrading their infrastructure to support that type of migration, right? If you look at the top spending, ca uh, the, the category that, we see that in, where we had the most responses indicating that they are going to be increasing spending in 2019 is cloud infrastructure security. So in other words, how people are choosing to secure cloud is, um, uh, is one of their top areas of concern right now, which I think is, is, uh, is quite interesting. I'm <clears throat> sorry. I wanted to switch gears for one second and just leave you with a couple of, of conceptual, one conceptual view here. And let's do a little role playing. Let's say that you are the, uh, you are a business owner and you come to me as a cloud architect and you tell me that you have some workload that you want to compute in the cloud. The, what I want to show you here is that how, just how different this environment can actually be. So if you come to me and say, hey, we have some cloud compute workload, one of the first things I might say is, okay, fine. If your workload happens to be a use case that we can use that, that has already been coded as a machine learning service, we can use that, whether that be uh, natural language processing, image recognition, speech translation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Fine, it's not that. It's, a, uh, it's, a, it's, it's still machine learning, but it's not any of those cases. Great, we can use the, the pipelines that they offer, SageMaker, Azure ML, AutoML, take your pick. Okay, it's not, it's not those, it's, it's a, a more specialized, maybe it's, it's, it's stream processing. Fine, there's cloud services for that as well, or database services as well. Okay, no, it's not even that, it's something that we have to code ourselves. Great, my first choice is going to be, perhaps it's something we can deploy as a function, whether that be Lambda, whether that be Azure Functions, Google Functions, or Cloud Run, which is uh, also interesting. No, it's not, we can't do any of that. Maybe we can spin it up as on-demand containers, and the two, option, the two key options here being AWS Fargate or uh, Azure Container Instances, so you could use uh, Google's uh, GKE or, or uh, Cloud Run here as well. Okay, it's not that. Fine, then let's, exit, then let's instantiate a Kubernetes cluster that we're going to manage ourselves and, and do this, or we're going to do it the hybrid way and use a, a, a container, a Kubernetes cluster managed by the provider. And if it's not that, then perhaps we can, tem we can template the app with something like, um, with, um, with something like a Beanstalk, for example, or just more broader cloud formation. And then lastly, we have a traditional VM. The point I want to make right, in spinning up EC2 instances, the point I want to make here is that just doing a lift and shift of workloads is far, far down the list of possible options for doing this. As you can imagine, uh, it's a trade-off. On one hand, we have much more portability down the layer and lower in the stack. It's easy to instantiate a VM anywhere. The, the downside is that we have much faster time to value on the upper layers. So we're kind of seeing that, that functions or containers are kind of a middle ground between the two, so we expect to see a pickup on that. Wrapping up, I wanted to comment on what kind of trends are we seeing. Huge migration or, or huge focus on, on hybrid, that's what we expect most enterprises are going to be at for the, for the next few years at least. That will include a mixture of uh, virtual machines, containers, and others. One thing we didn't touch on too much is that there is a skill shortage, and one of the ways that, that we're, we're addressing the skill shortage is through automation, right? The, the rise of security engineering, the rise of, uh, of uh, automated pipelines is a clear indication of that. And as I mentioned earlier, security is usually uh, the top concern or number two concern as organizations are moving these migrations. I want to wrap up with a couple of recommendations. The first one is, if you're a security professional, uh, you need to embrace this 100% all in, in the sense that, as I mentioned earlier, there is an expectation that from senior management that this cloud stuff can be made secure. So it's on you to show how, how to do that security, and it's on you to skill up to do that. 
uh, as you're de- as you're designing your solution, keep in mind that your environment is going to be uh, hybrid and heterogeneous for a while. You have to consider the fact that it's it's uh, it's going to be there's an issue of scale that you have to consider. Uh, work alongside the architecture teams, not not separated from them, not in parallel, but work alongside them, and. From my perspective, I think that you should start off paying very close attention to how your security is being built at, on the dev side of things. That's the, the, the shift left type of terminology. Uh, uh, make sure that you're building things securely to begin with. And then, of course, as you move that into production, you're going to need more. Uh, you're going to be concerned with the, the transition between dev environments and, and, and QA and, and, and prod. And you're going to be monitoring that prod environment for uh, for anomalies, which is one of the key areas where uh, I think that automation can play a part because it's now it's much easier to control this. Anyway, on, uh, thank you very much for listening. I'd now like Knox. I'd like you to, uh, to listen to what he has to say. Awesome. Thanks, Fernando. Um, so before I get in a little bit about myself, um, I'm running products focused on Cisic Secure uh, at Cisic. Um, a couple things about me. So I've been at Cystic four plus years now, um, kind of hopped all over the place, spent a year working closely with customers, uh, helping them adopt Kubernetes, get those clusters set up, uh, help fit fake in security, monitoring, performance management. Uh, and in general, I've kind of focused a lot on um, cloud, cloud databases in the past, uh, open source security and enterprise security uh, as organizations have shifted to uh, orchestration and containers. Uh, a little bit about Cystic as a company. Um, so our founder, um, he really started Cystic with the idea that um, network packets and the visibility that you used to have uh, isn't going to be available in the cloud. Um, so what kind of data sources can you look at to start getting visibility uh, into your environment? Uh, he had previously been behind the popular network packet analyzer Wireshark, and so now uh, he launched the Cystic open source tool uh, to get that same type of visibility, but using system calls as a data source. Uh, on top of that open source visibility that we built, uh, we uh, created a open source detection engine called Cystic Falco. Uh, last October, that was accepted to the CNCF uh, as a sandbox project. So uh, it's one of the two main uh, security offerings that's baked into the CNCF. Uh, we're seeing large adoption of that tool um, by companies like Lyft, Yammer, Snapchat, uh, Cloud.gov, and it provides deep visibility uh, into your environment. Uh, and kind of think of it as a mixture of something like AuditD or S-Trace uh, that's purpose-built for containers and Kubernetes. Uh, a little bit about Cystic as a company. Uh, we focus heavily on the enterprise, uh, have 300-plus enterprise customers, uh, have raised a bunch of money from companies like Excel, Bain, Insight Ventures. And then on the ecosystem side, uh, regardless of where you're running, Kubernetes will support you. So if it's uh, EKS, AKS, OpenShift, ECS, um, all the different cloud providers we have close native integrations with. Uh, so one of the things I'd like to touch on now um, is this graphic here. So we can see uh, over the past year, year and a half, uh, we've started to see different incidents that have happened uh, within the Kubernetes landscape. Um, first off, I'd like to say this is probably a positive thing. Uh, it becomes a whole lot easier um, to understand what's going on if uh, you start to see different public disclosures, CVEs, breaches, things like that. Uh, it means two different things. One, Kubernetes is being adopted. Two, uh, people are caring more about security, uh, starting to realize about that being an attack surface and then trying to put uh, mitigations in place. I think one of the things that people are starting to um, start to realize now, though, is kind of the legacy tools that you might have used uh, are going to um, not really work for API security use cases, uh, places where uh, you don't have a span port to get that type of data, and you need to kind of rethink some of your security strategies. Uh, so some of the main trends that we've seen uh, as organizations uh, move to Kubernetes, to containers, to cloud, uh, what are the, some of the main challenges that they see? Uh, so first off, if you're using Kubernetes, uh, you're going to have a bunch of different workloads uh, that are running on the same physical infrastructure 
Uh, so if someone breaks out of a container, you can easily have lateral movement. Uh, how can you track the different assets? Uh, what's running on the same areas of your infrastructure? Uh, and Kubernetes provides a lot of uh, flexibility here around tainting nodes, um, configuring network policy to build in isolation. Uh, so there's a bunch of things that are baked into Kubernetes, and uh, some of the challenges and the things that uh, your organization will need to figure out is how do you adopt the native platform tools to secure uh, your environment and your application. Uh, I'd also say um, organizations live and die based on uh, how good of a job they do with labeling their infrastructure, their applications, uh, and using the uh, different labels that are available through your orchestrator of choice. Um, so you're going to see a huge explosion in the amount of assets that you have, uh, the cardinality of these different labels, um, and so making sense of what's running where, what is it related to, uh, is going to be much more important. Uh, these labels also tie in closely to your policy configuration. So you shouldn't be setting up policy uh, that's associated with a specific IP or domain. You want to associate that with services, uh, deployments, and um, stay away from some of the kind of static models that you might have had in the past uh, to be more label and orchestrator driven. Uh, and then on uh, the container side, we often see organizations adopt um, them first within the DevOps organization. Um, so how are you baking security in that? How are you shifting left? Uh, the organizations that we've seen um, do a really good job at this is when you have security uh, both reporting up through the CISO and the legal and the compliance side, as well as, as, well as having uh, security teams that are reporting in directly into engineering. Um, so kind of looking at uh, some of the, the different approaches um, at, at the firewall level or uh, the tools that you might have been using in the past, um, installing an agent per container isn't something that will work. Uh, if you're reporting on vulnerabilities, uh, just reporting on all the ones that are on a specific host um, doesn't really make sense if you have uh, 10, 15 different teams that are deploying uh, different images from different repositories on that same area of physical or virtual infrastructure. Uh, and then if you need to go in and say, uh, what's the impact of this new CVE? How do you tie that back to an application, a service, and all those types of things? Uh, flipping over to the cloud native side, uh, a lot of the container security that we see today is specifically focused on uh, container images. But one of the nice benefits of containers is it's a building block that you can use in many different applications. Uh, so if you have a Redis image that's uh, running in your billing application, a Red, that same Redis image that's in uh, a back-end processing application and then one that's in data analytics, uh, how can you write different policy that takes that application context uh, that's exposed via OpenShift or Kubernetes uh, into effect? So now I'm going to flip to talk a little bit about um, how we collect data from your infrastructure, uh, and then some of the other approaches on uh, the container side. Uh, so Sysfig ourselves uh, will deploy as an agent uh, that runs as a single container on your infrastructure, and then from there we'll instrument the underlying host uh, in modern kernels through a facility called eBPF, or if you're running uh, legacy versions, we have our own uh, open source probe uh, that's part of Falco, Sysfig, and all the other uh, different open source utilities that we have. Uh, this system call instrumentation is going to give us visibility into uh, all the different containers that you're running, uh, the network metrics, the application metrics, the user activity, file activity, network activity uh, from the single instrumentation point. And this is really valuable because um, with other approaches, you might be overriding libc or running an agent per container. Um, and that's kind of defeating some of the processes and the trust that you built uh, throughout the development pipeline. Or if you're running a sidecar per container, you're losing a lot of the efficiency benefits and things like that uh, as you've moved uh, to this container environment. Uh, from a product perspective, we're really trying to integrate across the entire container lifecycle. Um, so using open source uh, facilities like Anchor uh, to do scanning pre-production, uh, to integrate natively with the tools uh, that developers are using. So having native Jenkins integrations, making sure that uh, you're returning the uh, security reports back to them in the tools that they're using, part of their workflow, um, so it feels native to them. 
uh, moving on to the audit side, uh, getting deep visibility into uh, the hardening of your infrastructure, so running Docker benchmarks, Kubernetes benchmarks, things like that. Uh, on the runtime side, uh, being able to use the data that we collect uh, to detect crypto jacking, to uh, cover file integrity monitoring use cases, or just things around um, is this changed container changing its namespace? Uh, had someone shelled into a container in production? Uh, those types of things. And then where we're very differentiated on the forensic side um, is the ability to uh, collect all the activity before, during, and after any incident that happens in your environment. So for all the Wireshark users in the room, um, what we're able to do here is take something really similar to a PCAP file, but instead of uh, containing network packets, it's going to give you all the system calls before, during, and after any event. And this is important because uh, in a container world, by the time someone in your SOC actually goes in to do an investigation, most often Kubernetes or OpenShift or whatever you're using has already killed that container and all of that data that you'd use um, for auditing and forensics uh, is completely gone. Um, so now I'm going to talk about um, some of the uh, different challenges and use cases uh, that our customers uh, have addressed by using uh, Cystic Monitor and Cystic Secure. Uh, so the, the first customer I'm going to focus on is the top five investment bank. Uh, they are actually running uh, their own C group and namespace isolation, uh, built their own custom scheduler, and have rolled containers out uh, to 100,000 plus hosts in their environment. Uh, and there's a couple different things that they want to track. So any network indicator of compromise. Uh, on this side, for uh, every single trading application, they want to uh, do process fingerprinting, so knowing uh, potentially the ticker symbol or uh, the environment variables or things like that that are associated uh, with any failed TCP connection uh, and those types of events that have occurred in their environment. Uh, they're also a heavily uh, Java shop, and in previous uh, performance monitoring use cases, uh, they would go in and pull every 60 seconds um, with a tool like Nagios, but in today's uh, day and age, if you're running these container workloads that are very ephemeral, uh, pulling every 60 seconds isn't going to cut it because a lot of these different batch jobs are running for 10 seconds, 30 seconds, and being able to uh, auto-instrument the JVM, pull out those performance metrics uh, without having to do any additional instrumentation uh, provides huge value to them on that side. And then uh, for this large-scale Linux environment, they've also aligned with the MITRE attack framework. Um, so being able to uh, map different detections to that and then feed that through their SOC workflows uh, is something that's very important. On uh, the next use case I want to focus on is an enterprise security vendor that has decided to uh, build their new SaaS offerings uh, on top of Kubernetes. And the challenges that they ran into here were first, uh, they tried to roll out Prometheus and from a performance monitoring perspective, scaling that, providing long-term storage, um, doing cost analysis on top of that data uh, was something that was a lot to manage. So they were able to pull in uh, that data to Cystic Monitor. On the security side, um, being able to audit this type of activity uh, becomes very difficult. So if a user is uh, cube execing into a host, um, it's not going to it's not going to give you visibility into um, kind of how that user got into a, a pod, uh, what type of activity happened once you're inside that container. So being able to tie um, activity that happens on the Kubernetes API also uh, and associate that with uh, your physical infrastructure uh, was something that was very valuable for them. Uh, the third use case is probably my most favorite. So um, this is a government research lab that sits on top of uh, 500 petabytes of CERN research data. Uh, so you have all of the, the different um, data that's coming from the particle accelerator, and there's all these different researchers uh, around the world that are accessing this open, uh, OpenShift cluster uh, to do analysis on top of all of this shared storage. Um, so the OpenShift operator uh, wanted to provide tooling to all these different developers and analysts um, so that they could be self-service uh, on that platform and be able to um, fix security issues, troubleshoot performance problems um, in a unified workflow. Uh, 
Um, so they're using Sysfig to uh, identify vulnerable images. If a workload gets decommissioned because it had a critical CVE, uh, providing visibility into what they need to fix. Um, from a performance perspective, if your app is crashly back offing, uh, being able to troubleshoot that. Uh, and then because all of this, uh, this, these research workloads are running on top of a shared platform, um, being able to analyze um, if sensitive data was accessed, what user it was, what exactly was read, uh, and that type of information. And then on the last side, um, we are working with a credit card vendor that uh, has containerized their entire build environment. So they're running Jenkins uh, on 100 different hosts uh, managed by Kubernetes. Um, so part of uh, the integration here is just natively scanning all of the images that are being built. Uh, also, one of the things that's kind of a little uh, interesting with Jenkins use cases is uh, to build containers, you need to run as a privileged container. Um, so making sure uh, that there's no breakout happening, uh, that you're effectively managing that attack surface that is build pipelines themselves. Uh, and then, like any organization, uh, your build pipeline is always something that's broken. Developers are shelling in. How can you audit any change that's made? Uh, the user activity that happens on top of the shared infrastructure uh, and things like that. So hopefully that's a quick overview of some of the problems that we're trying to address. Uh, and now I'd just like to get into kind of a quick demo of the product uh, to help show uh, some of the main features and use cases uh, that customers are using to address their problems in this cloud native space. Uh, we're going to focus this around build, run, respond, uh, and following the different areas of the container lifecycle um, and how you can best bake security into that. Let me share my screen. And uh, the first thing that I'm going to focus on is uh, really the first step that we see organizations take uh, as they're building out their security strategy, and that's how can I define what is an acceptable secure image um, that's being built within my infrastructure. Uh, so this is where we'll natively integrate with your registry, within your different build pipelines, and then give users the ability to say, um, if I don't see a health check that's part of this image, let me warn uh, the developer. Uh, if they've exposed uh, SSH as part of this image, uh, let's stop and fail that build. Um, if there's a high severity vulnerability with a fix available, uh, that's more than 30 days old and it's outside of my patch lifecycle, um, let's trigger a stop action. Uh, we've also done work here to uh, map these different um, functionalities around image analysis to different compliance controls. So you can look at something like NIST 800-190, um, check to see, okay, are my developers um, baking in secrets or access keys or have they set environment variables to contain uh, passwords and things like that? Uh, and then also, we recognize that um, kind of adopting containers, there's a lot of different uh, new things. Maybe all of your developers don't know how to uh, effectively write Docker files. So trying to build as many of these best practices into your checks as possible. So maybe we want to notify a developer, hey, you're running um, yum upgrade as part of your run instruction. You're not going to build uh, reproducible images. That's something you should be aware of. Um, you're using a label as latest. Uh, so this is one of the things that uh, I had a customer get burned by kind of early in their container experience where uh, they were tagging their database as latest. Um, that tag updated and their Postgres version went from 8 to 10. Uh, overnight, whole app went down. Uh, so doing things like properly labeling your images with a specific version, referencing those is really important. Uh, so all of this scanning policy can be uh, built directly into the developer pipeline. Um, so part of effective security is meeting your developers in the tools that they're already using. Um, so if you're building your images with Jenkins, being able to show them, hey, uh, this specific build failed because it didn't pass that scan evaluation. So you have uh, an exposed port with different high severity vulnerabilities. Uh, there's an access key that's baked into this image. Uh, and then from just a auditing and a traditional vulnerability management process, these are the different CVEs. Um, here's the fixed version and the links out to the different providers there. Um, so once you've scanned your images, 
um, have secured your dev pipeline, the area that a lot of companies focus on next is, okay, now that I've deployed these image, what's the status of what's going on in my runtime environment? Um, so what we're able to do here is show you uh, the different images that are actively running. Um, if a new CVE comes out, being able to change that policy evaluation status to a failure, uh, notify users on that side. Um, but looking at this from a physical perspective, um, doesn't make that much sense. So if I'm looking at a particular node, I'm going to see a bunch of different applications. Um, and so what we can do here is organize uh, all the data that you're viewing based on the logical separation that you're building into Kubernetes with namespaces and things like that. Um, so as someone on the risk side or if I'm de uh, developing a specific application, I can isolate a namespace, uh, see the services that are deployed into that, whether or not it's passing or failing, uh, and have that type of information. And then from a security uh, operations perspective, uh, if you want to go in and um, alert your developers that are deploying their images into the store front end uh, namespace, anytime their image has gone from a pass to fail status, uh, or if a new vulnerability has been added or updated, uh, you can do notifications based on the logical grouping that you're setting into your environment. So kind of once you've secured your images, uh, done different scanning, uh, the other areas that companies focus on is the next step is how do I harden that infrastructure uh, through different CIS benchmarks? Uh, so from a uh, product perspective, you can go in, schedule these benchmarks, again, based on any of that logical metadata. Uh, so if you have a production cluster where you want to run this once a day, uh, you'll have that type of flexibility. If you run a one or, want to run it once a month in dev, uh, you can split that out there. And then from the scheduling side, uh, often organizations might choose to not run SE Linux or uh, maybe you standardize an app armor instead. Um, so you can turn on or off these specific tests uh, to change what you're reporting on to customize that for your environment. Uh, one of the challenges that always comes up uh, with compliance and audit is proving, hey, I've run these benchmarks. Um, how am I trending over time? What type of information uh, can I see if I'm getting better or worse? Uh, so any custom uh, compliance check that we're running uh, will be able to expose uh, metrics about this so that you can alert and graph on the ability uh, of this benchmark score. You can prove to an auditor, hey, I've been running this test um, every day for the past um, 360 days, uh, 90 days, something like that. Uh, and then you can see for different teams, uh, are they getting better or worse, which specific subsections are, are causing these uh, failures and things like that. Uh, also on the visibility side, uh, one of the kind of key things uh, in a container environment is just understanding who's talking to who, uh, what are my different assets, uh, and all that type of information. Um, so. One of the unique things about our instrumentation point is we're able to go in and show the different uh, network dependencies, uh, which specific images are running in your environment. Uh, so here we're taking a host-based view where I can see a host, all the processes, all the containers that are running. Uh, but once again, you don't really want to think about your environment from a physical perspective. Uh, you want to think about it logically. Um, so you can reorient this data to then show uh, things like your different clusters. Um, so here there's a multi-cloud view of an AWS cluster, a GKE cluster. Uh, I can go into the specific AWS environment, uh, see my different namespaces, understand, okay, there's no dependencies. I don't see any unexpected connections there. Uh, can drill into a namespace, uh, see my different deployments, uh, go into a deployment, see the pod, the container, all the way down to inter-process communication. Uh, and this is very different than a lot of other performance monitoring or security tools that might be hitting Docker stats, and they'll say, hey, you have this container that's running at 90% CPU, uh, but you don't know what's actually going on inside. And then the last area that I'll focus on uh, really quickly before we get into Q&A is um, how do you do uh, incident response and audit activity that's happening uh, within these environments? So from a policy perspective, um, one of the things that Fernando brought up is um, having your security policy as code, building that into your infrastructure. Uh, all of the policy can be managed 
um, just as a YAML file, so the same way that you're deploying Kubernetes. Um, and we can detect things like if someone's launching a specific, suspicious network tool in a container, uh, if a user shells into a container, and that type of information. So say we see a user um, shell into an environment, uh, one of the first things you'll always want to answer is uh, what commands did they execute? Um, so here I can click on view commands, and it's going to take me back to that point in time uh, when that user accessed, accessed the container and give me the history of any command execution that happened. And remember, all of this data is still available regardless of whether or not that container is running. Uh, so here I can see the user spawned a shell, uh, curled down some package, untarred it, and then shredded the bash history. Um, so this is something that looks definitely suspicious, and I'll want to open up uh, that sysfig capture uh, to do further forensic analysis. So um, this is the same type of workflow that you would have had with a PCAP file in Wireshark, but now you're looking at this uh, with system call information. And at this point in time, I can look at, okay, when did that notification occur to set context, uh, overlay modified files, access files, network activity, and then those executed commands that we saw earlier to set trends. Uh, and then what you can do here is just isolate that point in time uh, that's relevant to your investigation. Um, so containers are short list processes. Maybe you want to drill into a, a specific area. I, I can drill into those executed commands. Uh, and then now I can see the same commands I saw earlier, but now let's go in and see, okay, what directories were actually written uh, when that specific package was untarred. And you can click on this tar process, switch over to the directories view. And now we're going back in time to navigate all the directories that were written inside that container at that point in time, uh, can go into the master directory, see the different files, uh, and then go into something like this readme file and actually view uh, the, into the specific content that was read or written from that file. Um, so from a SOC perspective, uh, this will give you the full impact of any incident. And then from an auditing perspective, a lot of our customers set these up to be able to prove, hey, if any sensitive data was accessed, who was the user, um, what did they actually read, uh, was anything modified, uh, and those types of use cases. Uh, and all of this data can be forwarded to Splunk, uh, Syslog, uh, any other tools that you might be using for uh, centralized event management. Uh, so thank you all for uh, kind of joining, sitting through uh, the demo. Hopefully we can get into some uh, good Q&A now on our side. Thanks, Fernando and Knox. It's now time for a Q&A session. As a reminder, simply type in your question in the box on your screen, and we'll get to as many as we can. Our first question is for Knox. What is the typical security and op adoption life cycle when making the cloud-native transformation? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so traditionally, I've seen uh, organizations try to port uh, their existing vulnerability management processes and focus on securing the build pipeline. Um, so this is where uh, tools like Anchor or uh, Claire or different open source options uh, are a good first place for organizations to start. Um, once they've kind of started to uh, port over this vulnerability management process, uh, then we'll see them start focusing on uh, the runtime environment, and that could be enabling uh, Kubernetes audit logs, um, going in and using network policy either through Kubernetes or through Istio. Um, if you're getting more advanced looking at pod security policy, uh, how you can build those into your environment um, and kind of moving uh, from the dev side into production. And then the last area that I haven't seen a lot of uh, workflows yet is uh, how you kind of bake in your existing SOC workflows to address uh, threats in uh, con container and Kubernetes environments. And that could be things like uh, tainting a node to make sure no pods get uh, scheduled there, configuring a network policy to isolate an incident, uh, and those types of uh, remediation actions on live environments. Turning into this next question is for you. What is the role of the cloud provider security efforts? So this is interesting because I think that the a lot of what the cloud providers do, uh, going back to the data that we've shown, right, they've been um, 
they've they've been improving their the, the capabilities that they can demonstrate uh, precisely to help organizations be confident that they can rely on cloud. That being said, I think that um, there is a very clear expectation from the cloud providers that there is a that there is a lot of uh, uh, work to be done by the clients themselves. Uh, if you've ever looked into the shared responsibility model, uh, that's uh, that's, the, the, that's where we're going towards. And um, the idea being that you're able to, they're able to provide a lot of security for, for the infrastructure they provide, but security for the services that you consume, that's entirely on you, right? So they, they'll have their primitives, of course, but, but it's, it's on you to do that. And we have some, uh, some other interesting data that uh, aligning where does that expectation uh, fall in the context of people who are more experienced versus more versus less experienced with cloud. Short answer is the cloud providers are doing their part, but it's still up to customers to do theirs as well. And to, to follow up on Fernando's uh, comment there, I think this is where the um, stack uh, chart that he presented earlier becomes really interesting. So uh, as organizations start adopting things like functions or serverless or using the ML APIs, uh, more of that security falls on top of the cloud provider or the cloud provider uh, and falls under that shared responsibility model. So uh, organizations as they adopt things like um, different ML APIs or serverless can actually offload uh, a large section of security to that cloud provider, uh, which is a huge benefit for everyone. It just yeah I, I I just I like where you're going with I like where you're going with that the one thing I'll I'll say is that the moment that you do that you still have responsibilities in terms of okay from a governance perspective can I give that data to that provider or mm -hmm. what are my permission boundaries on on using that data but you're absolutely right it's about uh, offloading some of that responsibility but again the point remains you can you can offload some of it but it's still your responsibility to do that. Yeah, to know what's in scope. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Next question. What do you see as obstacles for security and cloud native transformation? Sorry, say that again? Is this for me or for Knox? Um, I believe this could be for both, but I'll give it to you first, Fernando. What do you see as obstacles for security and cloud native transfer transformation? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you. What do you see as obstacles for security in uh, cloud obstacles. native transformation? Oh, obstacles. Sorry, sorry, sorry. My bad. Uh, uh, I think that the, one of the biggest obstacles I see security teams handling is that uh, it's it's a different uh, mindset about doing that when you're doing that transformation. It's about okay, you are now uh, you are now letting your uh, cloud offices, uh, cloud center of competence, whatever you call them, but but they are the ones orchestrating the security functionality provided by those providers, with you providing guidance, perhaps adding something. Right. This is a uh, and and I think that this is there. It's a gap for security teams in terms of uh, of mindset. Right. You know what that that. Yes, you are going to allow that team to control their own firewalls because it's their responsibility. It's not yours anymore. And so there's a, there's a mindset gap, and I think that there is, uh, and we're working towards it. I think that there is also a knowledge gap in understanding what it is that can be done in those environments. So when I say uh, when I said in my recommendations that you should embrace this 100%, I mean it from the bottom of my heart. Right? You really need to understand what are the capabilities within that environment, how customers can or how your teams can configure those, and then what what is missing uh, that you need to complement with, uh, with, ex with external tooling, for example. So we have time for one final question today, and this one's for Knox. What tools in CNCF can help with ops and security for containers and Kubernetes? Awesome. So I'll start on the ops side and then move over to security. So um, I think kind of one of the uh, 
best open source projects in the last five years is seeing the adoption that Prometheus has had. Um, so on the uh, infrastructure and service monitoring side, um, Prometheus has kind of become the standard way to expose and define metrics from your environment. Uh, and then there's been a lot of work uh, from Uber to develop things like M3. We've worked for Cortex to provide uh, the ability to uh, federate this data, to provide long-term storage, and to scale out your Prometheus metric store. Uh, and, and we're really starting to see uh, Prometheus get baked into the platform. So uh, OpenShift uh, ships a Prometheus server as part of an installation, uh, GKE on-prem, um, and I think more and more uh, applications will just have Prometheus baked in um, so that you can easily scrape it and get that type of information uh, without having to do the traditional instrumentation that you would have had to do on the monitoring side. Um, security, I'd say it's still pretty new within the CNCF. Um, so there's tools like OPA, um, which stand for the Open Policy Agent, uh, that allows you to kind of make yes-no decisions based on uh, the information that's provided with the pod. Uh, typically, we see them uh, being used with admission controllers, so uh, being able to verify uh, before a pod gets started in your cluster that it meets the business policy that you put in place. Uh, and then this is where also Falco, uh, as a CNCF project, um, we see a lot of users doing this for audit purposes um, where I need to be able to uh, send an event for every outbound connection that's happened to my cluster. Uh, or we see um, users doing it to um, log if a sensitive file is accessed, um, have open-ended uh, detections that are then being fed to your ELK stack, to stack driver logging, or um, different other tools so that you can respond uh, or aggregate the events that are being uh, co detected and collected in your environment. So uh, really, on the operations side, there's been a bunch of different uh, CNCF tools that have come out over the past uh, year or two, and it'll be exciting to see uh, what gets added from a security perspective uh, over the next 9 to 12 months. Thank you, Fernando and Knox. That concludes our webinar today. As a reminder, as a reminder the on-demand replay of the webcast will be available shortly. On behalf of Cystic and 451 Research, thank you so much for attending and have a great day.